another invited presentation, new places of common speaker contextual sets. The presenter will be Professor Mladen Pavicic, who is coming to the Bosch Institute. He published over 50 papers in current context journals and he has two books. One is Quantum Computation and Quantum Communication, and another is Companion to Quantum Computation and Communication. Professor Pavicic is a founding member of the Photonics Quantum Optics Research Unit of the Center of Excellence for Advanced Materials and Sensors, the Center of Excellence in Croatia. And Professor Pavicic was a visiting professor in many universities all over Europe and the United States. Now the current project is holography and interferometry under weak illumination. And he will give us a very interesting presentation about new possibilities in computation technology. But please give us your presentation. Well. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me here. So, I would like to present a specific example of distributed computing applied to a problem which is a hot topic in experimental attempts as well as theoretical ones to build a quantum computer. The application is on generation of the so-called Cohen-Specker contextual sets. Actually, contextual sets play an essential role, as recognized only recently in designs of architecture, for the time being mostly at the theoretical level of quantum computers. And therefore, it received fundings in the recent 20 years and a boost recently at the European level. So, what are contextual versus non-contextual sets and why is distributed computing important here? With non-contextual theories we have always got predetermined values for observables that we measure as opposed to quantum contextuality. Take for example a photon. A photon can have linear polarization either vertical or horizontal. Now you can have for example, in an entangled system, completely unpolarized photons, and still when you measure it, it's either vertical or horizontal in polarization. So, how do we, first of all, know it's completely unpolarized? Well, that's all what Cohen-Specker and other contextual sets are. When we design a system in which we measure photons in several different ways, we encounter an impossibility to assign definite values as a realistic classical theory would require and we can measure the values on a quantum system showing at the same time that it has got not predetermined values and that it can serve us further in quantum computation. The Cohen-Specker theorem embodies characterization of contextual sets, it says that there are arrangements, there are sets such that no two orthogonal vectors are both assigned value 1 and not all of any mutual orthogonal vectors are assigned the value 0. What that means? For example, you take a photon and you can measure polarization and you find your photon to be either horizontally polarized or vertically polarized. It cannot be both. So you can assign only one value one. It means it's true that it's horizontally polarized or it's true that it's vertically polarized. And on the other hand, we cannot have a photon on which polarization measurements would give no value. Now comes the computing problem in. We have to characterize the orthogonality somehow. The usual way is to look at the scalar products and form equations that would find vector components for such vectors. That's a very demanding task because we deal with nonlinear equations and all the computers in the world cannot do that within the age of the universe 
for the simplest CAIS systems. So recently we found a way to correlate such equations with hypergraphs. And we can forget the components altogether. We only look at the very simple task of whether it's possible to ascribe 0 and 1 in the way these two Cohen-Specker theorem conditions demand or not. So we have got in three-dimensional space three vectors that are mutually orthogonal connected with other three vectors that are also orthogonal and so on. In four and higher dimensional spaces we have got edges that contain four or more vectors. We say vertices on them. Vertices are denoted as dots and they correspond to vectors. Orthogonality is shown as a curve or as a line in between orthogonal dots. It proves to be statistically linear problem. It means it has got a statistically linear complexity. What it means? It means that we are able to reduce the complexity of the task combining such strings while designing the algorithms for solving our problem. We'll come back to that later on. That's uh, graphical representations of these two conditions from the Cohen-Specker theorem. And what we do, we use our algorithms and programs to find whether a particular set satisfies or violates these conditions. In particular, we make use of the program state 01, which simply checks whether these conditions are violated. The other way to find Cohen-Specker sets is the so-called parity proof. That means when we look at the P hypergraphs, which are such that the vertices share two edges. You see here this vertex shares these two edges, this one, these two, and so on. Then we have got even number of edges with possible ones assigned to them. For example, here, We've got two edges, here two edges. But if we pick up a hypergraph with an odd number of edges, then because of the first condition of Cohen-Specker theorem, we must have one on each of our edges. And since we have got odd number of edges, we should have odd number of edges with ones assigned to them. And that is obviously contradiction. That means we found the Cohen-Specker set. So there are two methods that we can use and problems connected with each of them. That means with the parity proofs, we must not have even number of edges in a set because such hypergraphs are ex excluded by definition. And then the majority of the Cohen-Specker sets with the odd number of edges are also sparse in having the parity proof because to various combinations, you've got all possible chances to have odd number of edges shared by particular vertices. And the third point here is actually summarizing this probability argument under B. And that means that altogether we have got under 0.1% of the parity proofs within such sets. In our approach, we have got nearly exhaustive generation of all Cohen-Specker sets, but the processing requires more time, so they are slower. Therefore, the optimal approach is to combine the parity proofs and MMP hypergraph approach. Just to explain the background of all that, uh, till the beginning of the millennium, within 33 years in 20th century since Cohen and Specker designed the theorem, only less than a dozen such sets were found. Since the sets are needed for our approach to algorithms and designs and architecture, quantum computers, we need as many of the sets as possible. On the other hand, we should know what's the general characteristics of quantum sets with respect to contextuality. With the parity proof methods that prevail in the literature, thousands and thousands 
Kochenspecker's sets were found in the 21st century. And with our method, we have recently found billions of them in many different types of Kochenspecker sets, in many different new classes, in four-dimensional, six-dimensional, eight-dimensional, 16-dimensional, 32-dimensional spaces. So that gives us the ramification of the problem. And on the other hand, it shows that even theoretical approach nowadays to such quantum problems is absolutely impossible in the old human way, because as I mentioned, less than a dozen sets were found directly by looking at some symmetries. So what are MMP hypergraphs? These are actually hypergraphs designed according to the MMP diagrams taken over from an older algebraic approach to sets in Hilbert spaces. The first two conditions are just statements of any hypergraph. The third one simply says that we can have intersections of the edges only in four or higher dimensions. Over the years, we designed many different approaches to that problem. The most recent one is here, containing practically 90% of all knowledge on the subject with respect to all previous ones, including our own. Let us briefly see how the MMP hypergraph approach can be implemented. We assign ASCII characters to vertices, that means vectors, in the following manner, for example, in four-dimensional space, each edge should have four vectors, meaning four vertices. So we arrange such a set in a string of edges. So one, two, three, four. This is one, 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 coming back to one. And then two, nine, b, i is here. And then this one is here. And this one is here. What's the best of that is that we don't need coordinatization, but as soon as we have to implement such a set within a real system to carry out an experiment, we have to have coordinatization, that means vector components, and we can easily find them for such a small set afterwards. But the better solution is to find a very big set, which is called the master set, from which we can get all smaller sets and then all smaller sets will inherit the coordinatization from the master set. This is an example how it works with our program MMstrip. We start with the master set 2424, then we delete one edge and we get 2423, where we delete several more ones, we get this. And still we have got 24 vertices here and only 15 edges. Now when we delete these two, we reduce both the edges from 15 to 13 and together with them two vertices from 24 to 22. And then we go down and down. And that's the so-called critical Kochenspecker set. And actually in what follows, I'll only show critical ones. That means that if we delete any more edge, it stops being Koch and Specker sets. And its importance is in the fact that when we implement an experiment, all these additional edges are not needed because they don't bring anything new to the experiment or to a gate or to an implementation. And we always practically deal with such critical sets. How does it all go on a classical computer when we need to generate such a set. We have got parallel processes starting from the master set, combining parity proof methods and uh, MP hypergraph method in decision divided procedure with the backtracing that enables us to find critical sets. That means that we go down and down, stripping edges. We check on parities, we check on Kochenspecker conditions. We, at the end, sort all the obtained Kochenspecker sets on isomorphism to eliminate all isomorphic sets, staying only with unique non-isomorphic ones. And then we get finally all of them sorted. So that procedure can be split in some more details, which are essential for showing how we achieve 
linear complexity, statistical linear complexity of an exponentially complex problem. Because it's all contained in the way in which we do backtracking in decisions which bring us to a final evaluation of a particular set. Here we have got several steps of assigning values to the set on which we apply the procedure. We prove that it's not possible to assign 0, 1 value and it would be a Cohen-Specker set if we were able to assign vector components but it hasn't got such a possibility so it is not the simplest Cohen-Specker set. This one is the simplest that exists in four dimensions. This one would be, but it hasn't got any vector component representation. It only serves us to show how we can assign values to particular vertices and verify that it's not possible to assign 0 and 1 in the sense required by the Cohen-Specker theorem. So as you can see, we have got many backtrackings here that refer to the previous slide. And I will skip these details going to the clustering algorithm that we apply that serves us to reduce the exponential complexity with hypergraphs in general and that means potentially with many appropriate systems of nonlinear equations. When we for example look at the previous quasi cohen specker set as a part of a bigger set. So what we do we can blindly by brute force try to find assignment but we don't do that. What we do is our program looks for dense clustering of the vertices inside the whole set. As soon as it finds it, then it verifies whether on this subset it's possible to prove the non-existence of the 0-1 assignment according to the Cohen-Specker theorem requirement. And if it is, then the whole set is Cohen-Specker. In this way, we achieve reduction of the exponential complexity to statistically linear complexity. I say statistically because we actually statistically try many such inner clusters and sometimes it doesn't succeed and therefore we have got also the time limitation in our programs that would then just stop evaluation. So the advantages of the whole procedure can be seen here. When we look at the parity proof algorithms from the literature, then we can see that in a particular class with the master set with 300 vertices, we can see that the other authors found all, only these types of Cohen-Specker sets. Our procedure, however, shows Cohen-Specker sets in the upper region of the whole cluster. Why? They don't have parity proofs and the other authors simply couldn't see this vast region. The other example is this. All sets here are completely invisible to those researchers that make use of parity proof methods because none of the Cohen-Specker sets in this class has got parity proof, at least after several million of sets found within our search. With this, I would come to the happy matrix end. And here, you can get all the programs free to use in enthusiastic attempts to find new contextual sets on part of any of you. I thank you for your attention. I had to leave, so I'll take over now. Uh, thank you very much for the very fascinating talk. Any questions? Just one, because we're running very late. Okay, I, I have one question. Very practical. What, what is the program written in that uh, you offer to now? Is it a C program or? C program, yeah. That's all written by ourselves because we are unique in the world. No one else came, first of all, to such an idea, and then it's a very advanced programming. For example, Brendan McKay is one of the most advanced theoreticians in the graph theory and he provided that short D program for isomorphisms and selecting sets that are isomorphic to each other. And it's actually part of his famous naughty program.
that many of physicists nowadays use. And the other programmer is the co-author of this presentation, Norman McGill. I just wanted to ask about the isomorphic uh, uh, sets you, you said you, you pull them out completely so they are not interesting or would you see some interest in having a specific amount of isomorphism which would then be able perhaps to, to have a different algorithmic, I mean, you know, you know yeah. I mean, in different ways you could get to the same isomorphic set. Our programs actually generate isomorphic sets, but since we deal only with the graphs, actually hypergraphs, because each of them has got more than two vertices on an edge, we need not take any coordinatization into account. And that means that all isomorphic sets are completely equivalent to each other. Yeah. And actually, thousands of them might be different according to vector components, but they are, according to the hypergraph structure, just one set, because you can always rearrange it to that one. Yeah. I saw that some hypergraphs combined yeah. uh, very well, uh, uh, also some graphs uh, derived uh, from uh, the theory, exceptionally beautiful theory of uh, everything which uh, relies on the real groups. Uh, are these uh, uh, your hypergraphs uh, also part of these uh, group, uh, real groups? No, 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 we are unique, we are original. We are completely unprecedented. These graphs I saw this beautiful Yeah, the only graphs that appears in an attempt to design error corrections and um, algorithms for quantum computations are here. And the parity proof approach by Aravind and Weigel also practically, in essence, provide you with the hypergraphs, but they don't use hypergraphs. They don't use the advantages of encoding hypergraphs in strings that enables you to put them in a computer because this thing and this visualization here is the same thing. Uh, so that is the hypergraph for computer. So any other similarity is just accidental. And when I came to this idea to connect the two fields, that means searching for cohen specker sets through various symmetries and simply assigning such string to vector components structure, then I realized here that this has got many advantages and offers us shortcuts and uh, possibility for quantum computation and possibilities for actually classical computation generating it. To just present you uh, a historical insight into that, uh, Perez, Asher Perez, constructed this set some 20 watt years ago. Then Cabello and co-workers, years afterwards, succeeded in deriving from this set, this one, and Asher Perez even tried to do it with the computer program and couldn't succeed. Why? Because they didn't have such a, a connection. They couldn't have any visualization of their results. Uh, the advantage of this is not only that you can put Perez set in a computer and within seconds you find all 1,300 of them, but also that you can visualize them. Okay. Thank you very much.